G'day guys, I'm Roscoe. If you're new to my channel, welcome to Life on the Hulls. I'm building a 40 foot sailing catamaran, almost from scratch. Three years ago I did the unthinkable and bought a fiberglass mold for that catamaran. And this is uh, the result of two years of work. So welcome to the channel and I'll see you soon. It's time to make my second blackwater tank for my starboard side. Now, I don't know whether you remember back when I made the one for the port side, I mentioned that I'd have to shorten it or reduce the size of it. Now, the other one's around 100 litres on the port side. I'm only going to end up with around 80 litres, um, maybe not even that, 75 litres on the port. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but it gives me minimal holding so that I can either pump out at a marina or at a, at a wharf that we have a pump out facility here, or get it out to sea where I can you know, dispose of the, uh, the black water correctly. Now, how I'm going to do that, I'm going to use exactly the same mould because this mould, I made sure fit both sides to save me duplicating making this mould. How I'm going to do that though, is that this was the size of the one on the port side. I've then got to reduce it down to around about this size. Uh, because the companion way that drops down on the on the starboard side actually is lower than it is on the, on the port side. So very important that I'm able to create a, a secondary flange. Now the other flange was all the way down here. Uh, I need to make one around about here somewhere. So if I measure upwards and create a second flange here, and this is how I'm going to go about it. So I've worked out I need to be at least 114 mil up from the baseline because I know this was level when I took the uh, the measurements for the original Blackwater tank and that line's right here. So that's where I need my next flange to be. There's no point in taking spirit levels to this because it's not going to work because the table's not dead flat. But Okay, so the base of my flange needs to sit here and it should be a pretty straightforward uh, operation to get this done. So as you can see, uh, I never throw anything out. These are the offcuts off the last tank that I made, which was uh, a couple of months ago, and I have kept them because I thought they'll be good to use as a secondary flange. And uh, just give them a quick trim up, I'll be able to glue them on to here and, uh, and use them as the flange. Right, so um, it's important to make this solid enough because you're going to be uh, laminating down quite hard onto this surface here. This isn't particularly thick, but it's as thick as the top of the uh, tank was. But that's going to be basically glued on there. It's not essential to have this gap uh, totally closed because I'm going to fill that with plasticine or modelling clay or something that's that's going to allow me to put a small radius on there. Because once again, I want to have a, a radius on the top that's not going to catch a debris. I'm trying to be careful not to have any sharp surfaces. Plus, it reduces the chance of air bubbles in the top of the, of the gel coat when I laminate over the top. But that's going to suffice. And, and essentially, I can clean this up as much as I like. But as soon as that's glued down, I'll, I'm basically ready with my flange to then start waxing, polishing, and going through the motions. Once again, I keep all of these foam blocks. This is all off cuts off the, the hole mold. And by keeping these, they made a very simple process uh, uh, a lot easier just by being able to hot glue something onto this mold. And uh, you know, this is how I've done a lot of my kayak molds and they've all worked out perfectly. I've got sea kayak molds that have flanges that wide. The bigger the block, obviously the bigger the flange I can carry. Um, I'm not going to be infusing or anything on these uh, these tanks. They're just too small and uh, weight's not really an issue with this particular.
So, key thing with gel coat, guys. Do not forget to stir it. If you don't stir it, you're not going to get the carrier, the styrene, to mix with the pigment. And ultimately, you could end up with triping, what we call tripe or alligatoring, where the, uh, the styrene attacks the surface of the mould and essentially damages not only the mould, but gives you a really poor end product. The key to this stuff is to give it a stir. I've given this a shake for about two or three minutes. Um, I've left it upside down. I like to do that, make sure that, because it's been sat here for about a month, hasn't been used, give it a good shake. I'm then gonna get a, a good paint stirrer, give it a stir. That's the key to getting the good catalyzing. Now, a lot of people do struggle with uh, catalyzing and gel coating. I don't know why. Um, now, this is a brush gel coat product. This isn't a spray gel coat. Spray gel coat's obviously thinner. I use a lot of spray gel coats over the years, especially with this cat and uh, with some of our spray phase we did on our kayaks. But for this water tank, it's not worth getting my gun out. I'm better off just to brush it. But brushing requires another couple of skills. It means you do long strokes, you don't do short strokes. You've got to make sure you get all the air out of that as well. So, and uh, make sure that your brushing is long and elongated and nice and neat and tidy and make sure you get an even thickness all over. You don't want brutal spots uh, on your gel coat. This is not as critical because it's going to get sanded out anyway. However, uh, you want a good surface. You never want to pull off a mould, a product that has a bad gel coat finish because it means you've got to go and start the whole bloody thing again. Another uh, tip, never use a screwdriver to open up a tin. Always use a can opener. A proper paint tin opener because it's got a wider tip and it doesn't tend to destroy the lid. Now you can see that's already well stirred. I'm now going to give it a further stir and uh, ultimately we're going to end up with a much nicer um, finish on our gel coat. Once again use brush gel coat not spray gel if you're brushing it. Easy enough to mistake to make and you won't like the result. Well, something worth noting, um, if you put gel coat or any sort of resin in a really deep bowl, it's going to go off quick. Sometimes you're better off putting it in a shallower bowl. Now, I know I'm going to put this out in 10 minutes or 5 minutes. If you had any longer than that with gel coat, you're going to get a really hot steaming bowl of uh, cracking resin. So get it out quickly, catalyze it, get it out, and get the job done as quick as you can, or put it in a shallow bowl. Okay, it's, uh, you can see you can never get an even finish, but the key is to have long strokes so you're not sort of stopping in the middle of the, uh, of the stroke as much as possible. You're never going to get it perfect. Um, <clears throat> the key is just make sure you've got good coverage and check for any bubbles. Now, in about five minutes' time, we're going to come back and check it again. But now that I'm set there, I can't go and play with that again um, because ultimately it's gelling and, and then it's going to start picking up bits of chunk of gel and it'll be an absolute disaster. Well, morning, guys. I did this at about 7 o'clock last night. I gelled this up and uh, went home, and obviously it was a pretty cool night. I've come in this morning. It's all set, so you should never leave gel coat overnight. It's just unfortunately I had the time pressure last night. I had to be somewhere, and uh, I'm back this morning, so it's nice and early. It's pretty cold in here, so I'm just going to spend the morning cutting all the cloth, getting this ready. Uh, I find if I just sort of roughly template it before I put it on, it saves me a lot of time when I'm actually laying it up. I want to be able to get straight onto it and get it done. So I cut the strips. I like to do these corners where there's a, almost a 90 degree. I, there is actually a little bit of a radius there. I like to always put an extra piece in there because that actually strengthens that area there. And it can be a bit hard to get the air bubbles out of there. So you've got to really make sure you work on this. So I do a small section first, just get a cup full of resin, work around and do these little edges first. You're almost stripe coating it with uh, a layer of chopped matting just to get a good bond to the gel coat. I don't want any air bubbles in that flange area because that's where the lid's going to intersect with it. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do. Leave it on the lazy Susan, keep spinning it around and get it all set up. 
get all my glass cut and almost tempered for the first two layers, and then I can come back when the when the water, when the uh, temperature hits about 15, 16 degrees, I can start laminating. I don't want to laminate until it gets a little bit warmer in here. It is a bit pretty cool in here. It's probably only about eight or nine at the moment. So uh, probably another hour or so, I'll get to around 16 degrees. It's going to be about 20 today. So perfect conditions for laminating. Okay, so I've got two layers of 300 there. You've seen me sort of carefully rounding the edges of the uh, of the mould there. Essentially, everywhere that could potentially get an air bubble, it's crucial you take your time. I used to go hell for leather as fast as I could, but nowadays I slow right up and I slow my catalyst down. And that's what you tend to work out as you become more experienced with this stuff is your catalyzing um, can really affect how quickly you can work and it's getting pretty gassy it is i'm gonna get this mask back on but working slowly is the key and and fine um sort of work can take a lot longer than you anticipate so never ever over catalyze don't think just because i add another percent of bloody catalyst it's going to be a better job you're actually going to get a better job by slowing it down a little bit so i'm about to put this layer of 600 double bias on and then there'll be a layer of 300 again and ultimately that's all i did with that orange tank up there and I think that's strong enough. I'm gonna put a couple of little braces in areas that I think it needs some support, but I'm gonna fill the orange one up with water later on and just see what sort of um, pressure that's going to be on the outside of the tank. I'm thinking an internal baffle will probably solve the problem. So I place my substrate like this. My brush hasn't got a lot of resin on it and I'll just lightly put it on like so. Get the, so it doesn't fall off again. And I see a lot of guys putting wet, 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 wet it out cloth on the product straight away and it'll slide off or, you know, I just stick it on. Use the stuff that's already there to adhere it. And then the key is if I don't just start pushing now, I'm gonna delaminate all the stuff I put underneath. So if I lift it up like so, and then gently poke it in dry, I'm maintaining the shape. And I'm not affecting the underlying substrate. And this is where a lot of um, air bubbling and bridging, we call it bridging, where you're getting one bridging another one and not actually closing up the gap. Um, that's where that occurs and unfortunately that is a big problem with a lot of uh, a lot of badly laminated boats and and product you, know, you get it in just about every every product but that's now flat down with no air bubbles and ready to laminate
So there you have it. One uh, reduced capacity blackwater tank. It's uh, two days after I laid up the second or my starboard blackwater tank. I'm going to demold it so I'm ready for the interminable struggle here. Uh, I know this is going to take a while and I've got to try to avoid busting it because if I bust the uh, modified flange that I put on this mold, then uh, I'm going to be in for a lot of work if ever I do another one. But I can't think about that. That could be years away. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to basically crack the seam or between the flange and the mold itself and just see if I can lever it open. I've got some high pressure air I can drive up into the hole that I left in the bottom here. From there, I'm hoping it's gonna release. Now, this could take a while. <laughs> you can see here the flange that I've put in there is, is not gonna be super strong, but I should be able to get a crack, at least get it cracked and relieved from the flange itself. It's physically getting it up off the mold. Um, because I can't go in from here, which I did with the last one, I was able to remove the base because I can't drive up in between the mould and the actual side of the tank. Um, I've got to almost try to chock it and lift it off uh, with a minimal amount of pressure to avoid busting all of the good work that I did here. Right, so first thing to do is try to find the separating line, which is right here, and get something thin like a little spatula. I've, I've done this a hundred times on video here, but you know, never do it enough and find a little bit of a line there, and there we go. So that's already separated. You can already see that flange is quite, uh, it's quite fragile. It's not gonna cope with a lot of force once I start to lever up. And uh, and then I get, I like popsicle sticks, or I call them tongue depressors, because we don't call them popsicles here, we call them um, uh, paddle pops. But that's what we call a paddle pop stick. In fact, that's a bigger version of a paddle pop stick. Our paddle pop sticks are tiny. But I get these sticks, and because it's wood, it's it's unlikely it's going to damage the surface of my product at all my mould. So I'll remote replace that. I don't want to use metal if we can avoid it. And then uh, wearing gloves very important. You cut your hand off. I'm just going to show you what happens when you make a really thin mould. This is why you need a thick mould. Um, this is giving rather than the actual product, but it shows that it is releasing. But if you watch this, watch the mould. Here. You can actually see the mould itself breathing rather than the actual product, and that's sort of not what you want. So it appears I was a bit ambitious trying to save the mould. Um, the mould's okay, it's the flange and the modification. So it looks like I'm gonna be back to square one. If ever I do another boat, I'm gonna start with the big one, then modify it and then go into the little one. But uh, yeah, getting this off. At least I'm gonna save this though. I'll just chuck it inside the mould, keep it all together. You never know. Moulds and made this one a lot easier. I mean, I've only been going for half an hour on this one to remove it, and this one's essentially ready to come out. So let's take a look. It's always a good feeling when you pop something out of a mould. Stop it. Oh, yes. Righto, so there she is. Okay, so a little bit of a clean up and uh, she's going to be spot on. So it's got to fit with the lid, but I'm just trying to make sure it does fit. This doesn't fit now, the other one doesn't fit. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Alright. That, that is 
Perfect, mate. I need to trim the ends off. Morning, team. Um, it's the middle of June here in, in Oz, and uh, I've just come back from two weeks of sea kayaking, snorkeling, diving in, uh, in Western Australia. And, and yep, it's time for me to deal with some things in the middle of winter that I can't do in the summer months. And one of those things is to apply this uh, Effidex cream to on my face. And uh, yeah, not looking forward to it because it's gonna be three or four weeks of going bright red and scaly and crusty and, and uh, yuck. So I'm not gonna hide it though. Most of you guys are sort of uh, duck and run for cover, but I'm not going to hide it. You guys are going to have to bear with me as I work through this phase. It's very important that I do this because I've been putting it off for a couple of years. And uh, you can see here these little sunspots that are starting to develop on my, on my face. And, uh, you know, as young Aussies, it's our rite of passage to go through this cream um, dilemma. But... Pretty much I've got about eight weeks where I can nail it while it's quiet and the sun doesn't have too much intensity in it before we head back into our springtime. So a lesson out there to all you young sailors and old ones alike, you know, get a sunscreen on because you start to pay for it. I'm in my early 50s and I'm starting to really get stuff cut out. I've already had one uh, basal cell carcinoma cut out of my face here this year. And, uh, and if I don't deal with it, then uh, yeah, could, things could get a lot worse very quickly. Um, this stuff essentially, I don't know whether you've ever seen it before, but it's essentially a chemotherapy for your face. Uh, can make you feel pretty grubby, but I'm gonna keep working on and, uh, and power on while I do it. I've just gotta stay out of the sun essentially. So I've got a period where I don't have to run any kayaking trips that I'm gonna, I'll put the boats away, I'm not gonna go sailing, I'm gonna try and stay out of the sun for as much as possible so I can get this done, so I can just look beautiful again. Um, my specialist has, has advised me, he said, I think you'll get some cosmetic benefit out of it. I said, what are you saying, mate? He goes, well, you might look a little bit better. I said, what are you saying? He goes, well, how do you think you look normally? So, funny stuff, but yep. That's the, uh, the future for Roscoe for the next month. And uh, yeah, not real happy about it, but that's the way it is, you know. Just gotta get on with it, you gotta look after your health. And uh, yeah, you gotta see a very different look at me for the next month, and I'm really sorry to do it to you, but I'm not gonna hide it, because it's so important that, uh, that it gets done. Catch you guys, I'll see you when I turn bright red.